So welcome to my talk. Thank you for the introduction. I've done this together with my colleague Markus Müller, Daniel Burian, Christian Kudera, and Wolfgang Kastner. I usually start with a single slide on our lab. So we are based in Vienna with a very strong focus on hardware security and especially physical attacks. Um, so we have some uh, pretty nice uh, equipment there. If you're interested in cooperating with us, I would be happy to hear from you. Good, so um, we have three research fields and the last one is high-speed cryptography and this is um, where this paper came out. Um, there are two versions of the paper because we ran out of pages. So the short version is the chess version and the long version is the extended version which is referenced there. So if you want to read that, um, you can easily find it. Good, so what's the problem statement? Yeah, as you might know, um, WPH2 personal is pretty much omnipresent. Um, everybody uses it. And um, the standard says that the minimum password length um, is eight characters. And what we currently often see is that especially like embedded devices, for instance, uh, routers, cable modems, or these wireless uh, 4G access points that you can buy, they use random passwords, but they are often very weak. So they are just maybe eight characters long and sometimes even the character set itself is limited. So this of course is not a, a, a high quality password and the practical question is always how fast can the attacker get with, with, with his key guesses and how fast can he like brute force uh, these passwords. There is also a picture here of a cable modem. Um, I will get back to that and you can see how these uh, typical passwords uh, look like. And this is like really widespread so you can uh, find that. So um, it really boils down to the four-way um, handshake of WPH2 uh, personnel. So whenever the station would like to uh, connect to the access point, um, the access point um, generates a NOS, the station as well. Then we have the first me uh, message from the access point to the station with the NOS. At this point, um, the station is, um, it, it can generate the PTK, um, the key material. Then it also sends it NOS, and this time it already includes um, a message integrity code. At this point, the access point can do the same. It returns a message uh, with its own NOS, but this time also with the message integrity code. And if everything was fine, then the station returns an empty message, but with a message integrity code. An important thing here is that we actually know the content of this message. It's empty, it is zero, it uses zero padding bytes, so we can later on use that to determine if uh, a password guess was correct. So um, the actual strong thing about WPH2 personal is its key derivation. So uh, we use the passphrase, we use the SSID, and then we perform the well-known PBK uh, DF2 function. And uh, this boils down to, to a lot of SHA-1 iterations. So it is uh, very computational, computationally complex. Um, after that, um, we use a pseudoroidum uh, random function um, with the nurses and the MAC addresses. Then we get out this uh, PTK I mentioned earlier. And the truncated version of this PTK is called KCK that is then used to create all these uh, message integrity codes by just using HMAC SHA-1. So how does a practical attack look like? Well, of course, uh, we need to capture the four-way handshake first. We can, for instance, also start to send out the authentication frames and then capture the re-authentication so we, we can easily capture the handshake. And then we can start guessing passwords. We need to choose a password. We derive the KCK for that. Um, using all the obtained information we have from the four-way handshake. And then um, we can then later on check if the computed MIC um, is the same as the one that we observed. And if it is, we have found the password. So um, I mentioned that we have a high computational complexity. This is why WPH2 personnel is actually pretty good in terms of um, password uh, security. So if you have a good password, then also high-speed attacks uh, won't help you against that. So overall, um, we have more than 16,390 SHA-1 iterations for each password guess. So this is really a lot. Um, the big question is how fast can we get? So we had a look and um, what's currently marketed to be the world's fastest uh, 
implementation is done by uh, Elcomsoft and Pico Computing, and they have an FPGA cluster that can do uh, 1.7 million password guesses per second. Big question is, can we beat that? Um, also another question is, um, how much money do we have to invest? So for instance, their solution, we did a price request, and their FPGA cluster costs $128,000. So that's not really in the, in the range of amateurs, for instance. Um, they also corrected their speed a bit to 1.9 million guesses. Okay, so much for that. So can we do better there? Um, of course, for that, we need to have a closer look at SHA-1. It works on 512-bit chunks. We get this 160-bit um, hash. And internally, uh, SHA-1 has 80 rounds. There is a, mesh, a message working schedule. So at first, uh, the message is broken up, and then for later iterations, we use a combination thereof. This is just um, important to have a look here uh, that the, the functions that are used here are very easy to implement in hardware. They are not costly there. And the, the central piece of SHA-1 is this compression function. And once again, we can see that uh, most of the operations that we have in here, they are ideally suited for a hardware implementation. The only expensive thing that we need to consider, that we need to deal with, are on the right side these rectangular symbols. They are 32-bit additions. And in those, we have the carry chain, of course. So this is the main limiting factor for a hardware implementation. So um, we created an FPGA um, implementation um, that has the following design. Um, we have uh, like an, an outer state machine that is just used to talk to the outside world. But the important thing is we have this password verifier and a password generator that's inside the FPGA. And the central piece is this um, high performance SHA-1 pipeline. And usually, like I said, SHA-1 has 80 rounds. So you would have an 80 uh, stage pipeline. In our case, we have uh, 83 stages due to a few optimizations. We have a buffer stage to reduce the pipeline input logic delay. And the problem are the additions. So we split up the additions. This is possible in SHA-1. Um, and um, we have an initiate and an add uh, stage to split up those additions. Um, a few other optimizations we did is uh, we compute the HMAC outer state always first. This way we don't have to store the intermediate result. Then um, to avoid routing issues. Uh, so in the pipeline, if you have a very broad bus, you easily get all these routing issues. To avoid that, we use uh, block RAM delay lines instead. Then um, the state machine is, of course, pretty complex. Um, and instead of having like this huge, big multiplexer that will uh, will be very slow in the implementation. We split it up in several smaller multiplexers. Then, of course, we have uh, custom build parameters to, uh, to, to leverage all the internal functions of the FPGAs. And we performed extensive for planning. This is like the typical state machine that you have for, uh, for the key derivation. Um, it uses the SHA-1 um, pipeline. And you can just say, uh, see here that uh, we, we compute like the, the, the different states here. And at the end, we get out um, the MIC. So the password verifier, what it does is it uses um, the password generator. And we have, we have as, as many cores as we can fit of the SHA-1 pipeline in, a, in an FPGA. So the password verifier has to fill up each of those stages in each core. That this is what it does, and then it just waits until uh, the computed mix are available, and then later on we can make the comparison and see if the password candidate was the right one. Um, we focused on low-cost FPGAs. Um, so we did three different implementations. One implementation is for the Spartan 6, the LX150. Uh, this, uh, this type of F FPGA has been used for Bitcoin mining. So you can, you can just buy these boards um, on eBay because nobody uses FPGAs for Bitcoin mining anymore. But for this kind of applications, they are ideal and also cheap. Next thing is we use the, the newer Arctic 7 on a development board. And for comparison purposes, because Pico Computing uses the Kintex device, we also use the Kintex device, but uh, we couldn't really test it um, because we didn't have these expensive FPGAs. But we created an implementation for it, and we, all, we have the, the full results of the design suite. 
So this is like the first implementation. Um, we managed to fit two cores at 180 megahertz um, on the FPGA. Next thing you typically have with these things is you need to care about temperature. If the temperature gets too high, you get bit errors. So unfortunately, neither the board nor the FPGA has a temperature sensor. So we implemented dynamic frequency scaling based on the error rate. So as soon as we get error, we clock down the FPGA a bit. And you can already see the floor planning. So you see the big pipelines, and in the center there is like the state machine and the password verifier core. We also managed to fit three cores on that, but uh, the, we then had some, some routing issues and the achievable clock frequency was much lower. So uh, also the performance, the entire performance of the FPGA was lower. Yeah, we have that in an FPGA cluster. It's also low cost. We bought all the boards from eBay. So this is also what amateurs can do. Um, this is the Artix implementation. It looks a bit more uh, distributed. Um, we have eight cores, also at 180 megahertz, also dynamic frequency scaling. So the, um, this time the Artix has an internal temperature sensor and the term, uh, yeah, um, whether the, whenever the temperature is low, it scales up its own frequency and the other way around. So that's pretty neat. And we have a start topology as well. So in the center, once again, you have the password generator, the password verifier. Around that, uh, we have the pipeline stages. And this is the Kintex, um, 16 cores at 216 megahertz. Also dynamic frequency scaling um, is implemented because it has an internal temperature sensor. Start uh, topology once again, but like I said, we couldn't really test it because we didn't have this expensive type of FPGA. So the results. Um, yeah, um, for, the, for the Spartan uh, 6, uh, we, 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 we calculated, or for all FPGAs, we calculated uh, the, the number of key guesses that we can do uh, per second in theory. So for the, for the Spartan 6, for a, uh, for a single FPGA, that's like 20,000 something passwords per second. And then we compared it to the actual measured performance. And the measured performance was also 20,800 something. It's a bit less because of the communication overhead that we did not consider in our um, calculation. The, um, the Arctic 7 um, can do uh, like 87,000 uh, passwords per second. And now the interesting thing for comparison purposes is if we, what would happen if we would use the, um, the hardware of Pico computing that can do the, those 1.9 million guesses um, per second? Well, um, according to our calculations and according to the reports by the design tools, we get out more than 10 million guesses per second, which is five times as fast as their implementation. So um, this is a new speed record on their own hardware and um, yeah, that's the result. We also did a um, GPU comparison just to see how well GPUs performs. Um, we used uh, CUDA Hashcat. We used uh, those well-known GeForce, uh, GeForce uh, GPU graphic cards and also grid computing graphic cards. Um, you can see that on the better graphic cards, uh, you can uh, also like achieve like uh, 52,000 uh, key guesses per second for a single graphic card. But the big difference is that the price of the card is then usually higher than these low-cost FPGAs, and you have much more power consumption. Uh, whoops. So um, this is then, uh, we also performed a real-world case study. This is something that's only in the extended version of the paper because we wanted to, ha to have a look at the real-world impact. And so we had a look at these uh, widely, uh, uh, widely available UPC cable modems that you can find everywhere. So you just have these weak passwords uh, just eight characters, always uppercase uh, characters, and um, they are random. So we made the assumption that um, if you have one of these cable modems at home, and it has an SSID of UPC and the six-digit number, and you would change the password for it to something more secure, then those people are also likely to change the SSID, because who wants to have uh, an access point at home with, with such an SSID? So this was the assumption, and so we, we started to collect some handshakes with these cable modems, um, and we tried to, uh, to like, uh, guess the passwords of, of some of these networks that we set up um, with our own cable modems. And it turns out that we can break the password at, uh, in three days at most. Now the next question is, 
what's the real impact of that, how many of those Wi-Fi networks are there. We use the Wiggle war driving uh, Wi-Fi data set. It's of course not complete, but it gives us an impression of how many of those networks can be found. And alone in the city of Vienna, we found more than 120,000 of these networks in the database. And in, in Austria and its border regions, it was uh, 166,000, which is maybe due to the Wiggle data set because in the rural areas, there might be less people who do board driving and then submit their results to the Wiggle data set. Um, yeah, so we could pick any of those networks and in at most uh, three days, we could break into them. This is a map, so you can see that in the city, these networks are like really everywhere. So let me conclude. Um, we have a new implementation speed record if we compare it to the currently marketed to be the fastest um, implementation. Um, we showed that these professional grade brute force speeds can now also be achieved by amateurs because they can just use those old Bitcoin mining boards for that. We also showed that FPGAs are ideally suited for this, uh, for this work. And um, we showed that real world networks with, uh, with these weak default passwords are like not really secure, meaning that you can just break into them in no more than three days with this kind of hardware. Future work is we would like to support password lists as well. So right now our focus was just on random passwords. Um, it would be great to build an Arctic 7 low cost cluster to uh, evaluate it further. And it would also be great if we could try our implementation on, a, on an FPGA cluster like the Copacabana. So thank you for your attention. Um, for more information, please have a look at the extended version of the paper. Uh, thank you for your attention, and if you have any questions, please ask them now. <laughs>